All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to 50 Years of Injustice, a conversation about ending the war on drugs. My name is Janos Martin, and I'm the National Director of Dream Corps Justice. Uh, I'm really excited that you all can spend the next couple hours with us. We have some incredible people uh, lined up to have some really important conversations. You know, 50 years ago this week, President Richard Nixon declared that he would end the scourge of drugs in America with the war on drugs. And over the next five decades of failed and horrendous policies, millions of people were incarcerated, millions of families torn apart, hundreds of billions of dollars spent, and for what? A policy that we know has only harmed communities and hasn't worked. Just last year, we had the most overdose deaths we've ever had in the history of our country. We have many people still behind bars, and we'll talk about it later today for reasons that are completely unjust. And we've broken trust between law enforcement and the community over these failed policies. So we could spend all evening talking about the past 50 years and, and why they've been such a failure, but we want to be more hopeful than that at Dream Corps and talk about the future, talk about the solutions. And so we've got a lot of people here who are going to share ways that we're going to end the drug war so that we're not having this conversation 50 years from now. Heck, we're not even having this conversation 10 years from now. We're going to talk about passing the Equal Act, creating clemency for people uh, with marijuana convictions in the federal system. We'll even give a teaser about our future campaign to end, uh, to close federal prisons as ways to scale down our federal prison population. You're going to hear from elected officials, people in Congress. You're going to hear from activists and advocates who have spent their career fighting for this change. And you're going to hear from artists, athletes, people who are making a difference in all kinds of ways. But we're going to start with a group of people who we always want to center at Dream Corps people who have been directly impacted by the policies that we talk about. So for our first panel tonight, I'm really excited to bring three of them to the stage with me. Dante Westmoreland from The Last Prisoner Project, Ruby Welch from our own Dream Corps, and Weldon Angelos who, uh, from, Mission, from Mission Green, who is one of our partners for this event along with Last Prisoner Project. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, to the two of them. Weldon's gonna be with us in a minute, but I'm gonna turn it over to Ruby and Dante. Sorry for the sirens in the background, probably responding to a drug crime that police don't need to intervene on. But Dante, let me start with you. I would love for you just to share a little bit about your story and journey, uh, why this issue is so important to you and what you're doing now to change drug policy in the United States. He's on. He's on. You're muted, bro. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Sounds good. Yeah, for anybody that missed that, I was incarcerated in Kansas uh, in state custody. Um, I went in there, I was wrongfully incarcerated. I had to go in prison, uh, pick up the law book, uh, really had to study law. Um, got appointed a public defender. Uh, he came and seen me. He filed the motion for immediate release. Um, and then I was released from custody all for a first time marijuana offense. I served about uh, four years on an eight year sentence. I'm still supposed to be in prison right now, but by the grace of God, I'm out. And now what I'm doing now is just bringing awareness in states like Missouri uh, and many other states uh, and letting people know that we're here for you. And Weldon's done a fantastic job, you know, helping me and motivating me on getting these prisoners out along with the last prisoner project. So I'm just doing advocacy work for them and keeping my best foot forward with my story. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dante, for that. Weldon, I'm glad that uh, we got our tech, tech issues figured out. We're so excited to have you here with us. Uh, you know, you've been an inspiration to so many people involved with this event. For now, do you want to just start off with sharing a little bit about your journey, uh, how you came to this moment and the work you're doing to end the war on drugs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was an up and coming music producer in the mid nineties. You know, I made, uh, you know, my dream career. Um, and you know, I was working with legends. I grew up working, working or uh, listening to as a youngster. Um, and I ended up getting caught in the system by um, a, a sting operation for $900 worth of cannabis. It was my first time offense. Uh, the case went federal and I was ultimately sentenced to 55 years. Um, and it was a sentence that was so draconian that even the judge who was forced to impose it 
ultimately stepped down in protest of the sentence. Um, and it took about 13 years, uh, you know, a bipartisan coalition, you know, came to my rescue and I was released in 2016 and utilized that same alliance that helped get me out to fight for the people that I left behind. Wonderful. We're going to be talking a lot more about the work that you're doing as we move forward. And first, we're going to hear from Ruby, uh, Dream Corps Justice Organizer. Ruby, uh, how did you come to be impacted by this work and what are you doing now to change the system? Hi, I'm Ruby Welch, uh, originally from Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, where I was um, convicted of possession with intent to deliver less than 12 ounces of crack cocaine, in which I was given a 30-year sentence. I served seven years, five months, and six days. I'm still on parole after 15 uh, years. Uh, and the work that I'm doing is to make people aware that um, sometimes nonviolent offenses are just as harsh as violent offenses. Let, let's let's stay with you, Ruby. Um, I would love. I know that you've devoted a lot of your career to working specifically with women who are in the prison system, um, women who have come home from prison. Can you talk about how the war on drugs has impacted uh, some of the women that you've worked with and gotten the chance to work with through the years, and and what part of that story most people don't know? Um, I think that it actually grieves me the war on drugs towards uh, women, especially women who are addicted to drugs. Um, I myself was uh, not a drug user. Uh, I smoked two joints in life, once when I was 16 and once when I was 24. But when I saw the women coming back and forth to into the prison system, I felt like I needed to come home and do something about it because uh, most of these women were, um, like I said, not only addicted to uh, drugs, but they had been abused as minors. And so, Hurting people hurt people, and the people that they were choosing to hurt were them, themselves. And I don't feel that our systems should lock you away for an addiction. I, for one, because of I saw the number of recidivism, um, feel that um, they should be given the opportunity for treatment because locking them away doesn't make it better. It just, it it just puts the um, addiction kind of dormant for a moment, and then when they come home. It's, it's seven times, sometimes eight times worse than when they came in. Hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Dante, uh, you know, when we talk about the war on drugs, I start off by talking about Richard Nixon and President declared the war on drugs, but it wasn't one president or even one political party that created the war on drugs. It was thousands of actors uh, in the political system who made the choices that have led us to this moment. And what struck me learning about your case is, uh, there were a lot of people who perpetuated the injustice that led to you being given such a long sentence for a first time offense. Um, can you talk a little bit about the different actors who perpetuate the injustices of the war on drugs? Yeah, I mean, for all the viewers out there, you gotta make sure and you gotta understand that who are you putting into these offices? Uh, voting is the most important thing to, you know, identify those perpetrators or those bad actors, as you would say. Uh, for the war on drugs. So I just encourage everybody, whether you are in Kansas or many other states at the state level and federal level, write the legislators, take action, write the state representatives, write the district attorneys. A lot of people think voting ends with the president or the governor. And I used to have that kind of mindset, but those judges, those local district attorneys you put on office determine who are they gonna prosecute whether or not it be marijuana. So make sure you guys pay attention to who you guys put in office. Absolutely. And you know, right now, the idea of electing progressive district attorneys or reform-minded district attorneys is something that's been going on the last four or five years. And we've gotten a lot, of, a lot of bad actors out, but there are still hundreds, if not thousands, of district attorneys who are perpetuating these injustices every day, as well as judges uh, who are often elected to office at the state level. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and just, you know, just educate. Education is the key to anything. You know, you educate about the person that's running for office and you will understand what they believe in. Do they believe in the same thing you believe in? That's the question you have to ask yourself before you pass that vote or that ballot. Absolutely. Now, uh, well, let's pivot from the state to the federal. Um, you know, Weldon, you, you were given an extremely long sentence, and it's one of the reasons that... Um, it just sort of shocked the conscience. And I think that's one of the reasons that your case garnered such attention. And fortunately, people were able to come together over it. Can you talk a little bit about how the war on drugs works at the federal level? Maybe explain 
you know, stacking or, or some of the things that people might be less familiar with, with how somebody um, for a very simple drug crime could wind up serving years of time in the federal system. Yeah, so I'll give you an example that, that my judge uh, noted in his opinion of my case. He did something interesting. He investigated what my sentence would be if I were prosecuted at the state level. He reached out to the local district attorney and, and the local probation office. And, and it was interesting what he found out. He determined that under the same set of facts on the state level in the state of Utah, I would have received likely probation or at most a couple months in jail under a misdemeanor conviction. Mm. Yet the federal government, uh, you know, through Congress, determined that I should serve a half a century in federal prison for roughly $900 worth of cannabis. And that just shows that our federal system is completely out of whack when our own judges are stepping down in protest. And so that's the difference between the state and the federal system. I think the state it gets, gets it better than the federal system gets it. And so that's why the federal system so draconian. Um, the way I was charged also by prosecutors and the agents is that they could have arrested me under the first transaction um, you know, there was a sting operation. They set up three control buys for $300 worth of cannabis, and they could have arrested me on the first one. And even under the federal guidelines, I probably would have gotten a light sentence. But instead, they continued to set up these buys so they could stack my sentence and put the maximum amount of pressure on me. So to force either cooperation or an unjust plea offer. Wow. And that certainly doesn't really serve public safety any way you slice it. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I have a question now that I want to pose to all three of you because all three of you, um, you know, had that unfortunate uh, situation where you were dealt an unjust hand, and yet all three of you have been back in the community ever since, trying to make change, talking to legislators from sheriffs to state senators to uh, the U.S. senators. Uh, one of them gave Weldon a shout out on the floor of the Senate the other day in trying to pass a bill to reform the system. So my question to each of you, and, and maybe I'll start with Ruby. You know, what is, when you're talking to a legislator, as somebody who's been directly impacted by these issues, what is the biggest misconception that you're trying to correct them of when you're explaining to them why our drug policy has been wrong and why we need to change it? Uh, the main thing that I always um, try to make them see is that we're human. Uh, and to the misconception that once a criminal, always a criminal. No, I created a crime in 1996, I served my time. So in 2021, I'm not a criminal. I'm a human being trying to re-enter back into a society that you're still holding me hostage. Mm -hmm. And I just make it so real to them in that aspect as, as far as humanizing it, that would you wanna be held ransom for the rest of your life after you've paid your ransom, would they still wanna hold you hostage? Absolutely. Well said. What about you, Welton? Yeah, so I think public safety. Um, a lot of members of Congress think that incarcerating individuals who are engaging in drug use or drug trafficking makes us safer when it actually makes us less safe because now we're utilizing all the resources that could be going into stopping violent crime. And so that's the key argument that I make is public safety. Great. What about you, Dante? You're on mute again. For me, it's kind of what, you know, Weldon touched on. I mean, when I was incarcerated in the middle of COVID, I had a state rep come and uh, came and see me. His name was Willie Dove for the state of Kansas. And uh, he shared with me that he didn't know people like me can serve that much time for marijuana. He didn't know when he was elected official. So when I sit back and I look at that, I say, how many more legislators are like you? You know, he even instead of like do you see a parole board but at this time these are mandatory minimums at the state level for kansas so it's the education more than anything and just to touch on one thing i got a guy named kyle page i'm trying to work to get out of prison and all he wants to do is see his daughter graduate he got caught with cannabis and uh he did the crime he admits it um he gets out december the end of this year his daughter graduates at the end of this month what we're trying to do is, what is this inmate gonna learn? He hasn't been in trouble. You know, I, I shared this with the legislators, uh, Senator David Haley, and I said, you know, this person hasn't been in trouble since he entered the system. What is that person gonna learn between now and his daughter is out date, you know, and 
memories are what these guys are missing. So I think these legis I think these legislators not only need to be not so hard on crime, especially not with cannabis, but they need to realize these are real people we're talking about that are missing memories. Imagine you guys missing your daughter's birthday party or whatnot. So we're working hard on trying to get that happen. But the biggest misconception to me is, you know, they think that that last day in prison, they're going to learn something more when you can evaluate an inmate and understand if he has reformed or not. You know, even though we all agree that people shouldn't be in prison for cannabis, I think we all need to understand that people have reform and the proof is in the inmates profile. So I think they need to do that. That's what I wanted to touch on with that topic. Absolutely. Well, I want to piggyback off what both Ruby and Dante said to ask you a question, Weldon, because uh, think about the percentage of the people in the federal prison system for their, for some drug related crime. It's thousands and thousands of people. It's a higher percentage than at the state level. So, I mean, to, to talk about the sort of humanization, talk about this reform, I mean, can you sort of share with people, uh, you know, from your own experience, just, uh, you know, what are misconceptions people have about those in federal prison for drug crimes? I think, you know, the way the media might portray it sometimes is that, you know, if you wind up in federal prison, you must have been some kingpin the feds are going after, but that's that's hardly the truth, right? So would you could you elaborate a little bit on in your experiences with people that you served with uh, in the federal system? Yeah, absolutely. So that that is the, the key misconception is that if you go federal, you got to be a, a member of a cartel, a kingpin or a murder. And what's funny is even when I went to prison, when I got there and people knew what my sentence was, they didn't believe me what it was for. But like, you had to have killed somebody. You don't get 55 years for drugs. But the majority of people in federal prison that I met were very low level offenders. A lot of them were, you know, nonviolent immigration crimes or, you know, very low level crack offenses. You'd be surprised how many people were in prison for, you know, the crack that could barely fill up a sugar packet. Um, so I would say that probably about 75 to 80 percent of federal prison are these low level nonviolent offenders. And and what and, and how does that even come to be? Like, you know, what are like what are the agencies that are, are causing that? Yeah, well obviously, um, you know, in the in the nineties, the feds, you know, the, the, the exploded with the laws with the um, you know, the uh, I would say Clinton crime bill, but it's really the Biden crime bill, you know, really exploded the uh, the prison system. You know, it just they started arresting everybody for for the minorest crimes possible. Gotcha. So there's one more question I want to pose to um, the whole group, uh, again, because you're all such strong advocates now. You know, we want to be solutions based in this conversation tonight. Um, Ruby, I know you've been on the ground for, for years in Arkansas, ever since you came home. Uh, you know, how, how would you recommend that people who think the war on drugs is unjust or any criminal justice policy is, is wrong or broken? What can people do to get involved, to, to move from education to action, to, uh, to take the first step of, of making a difference uh, in their own local communities. I'm sure we've got people watching from all over the country, but based on the organizing work you've done for years in Arkansas, like how should people get involved? Uh, uh, not to sound uh, too uh, biased, but uh, I would say um, get in con contact with myself, um, get in contact with Dream Court Justice, uh, join our Slacks, join our Zooms, come on our weekly meetings with our motivational, uh, uh, our mindful uh, meditations where you can relax, uh, be in conversations where people are actually doing the work because a lot of organizations are talking about doing the work. And I'm one of those people, I hate talking tables. Uh, I'm, way, I'm at the action stage. And um, that's why I've hung with uh, Dream Core for so many years because I saw the change because I was a part of the change. Uh, and if, if if something isn't moving forward, it means that it's stagnant. And I don't know about you, let your water sit in your sink for about two or three days and it's gonna become smelly and every bugs and everything's gonna be around it. But that's not what's going on with uh, Dream Course is not what went on with me. And I, I thank them because um, you need to get involved uh, with, the, with the people that are really the movers and the shakers, not the ones that are just talking about what they're doing. If people aren't moving the uh, needle when it comes to formerly incarcerated and incarcerated people, that's not the organization you need to be a part of. Well, th thanks for the plug, Ruby. And we'll, have, we'll definitely have links for people to, uh, you know, to sign up uh, throughout the event and, and get involved with our Empathy Network. But uh, 
but you know, Dante, you're traveling around the country. I mean, you were just beforehand, we were just talking about how you're, you're pretty far from home doing the work right now. You know, if somebody is intimidated about, okay, but what do I do first? Yeah, how would you just encourage people to get off the sidelines? Yeah, just pick up a pen and piece of paper and write the person that made these laws. You know, whether it be the federal, you know, if, if you got per something personal with that or whether it be the state level and really dive in. If you really care, like you say you do and you feel for our stories, whether it be Weldon's, Mines, uh, Corvain's, anybody's, you need to be inspired to make a change. And it doesn't cost to put a 50 cent stamp, you know, on an envelope and send it to, you know, United States senator because um, they do care. They do care about their vote. So. I would encourage people just to take action that way and really get with your grassroots organization. So there's a lot of local grassroots organizations that try to advocate, you know, as much as they may not have a big platform, but you know, they're out there knocking on these doors, trying to make a change and also get with like the Weldon project and the last prisoner project.org. You can click on a, a, a link called take action where you can sign a petition. You can figure out what you can do in that state. So there's so many initiatives that you could take advantage of. Of course, Dream Court is fantastic. They can help you lead the way um, wherever direction you decide to go. But really, it's as simple as just picking up a pen and piece of paper and just send the letter off. And hey, if you can grab 10 friends to send a letter and you send 500 letters, they're going to understand that. They're going to they gonna realize that a lot of people in time is changing. So we're stronger together than apart. And us divided, we can't conquer anything. So we want to make sure that you know, we keep that tunnel vision together. I appreciate that. And while, while I still have you, uh, Last Prisoner Project, do you want to share, you know, one of the one of the specific things you're working on that, that you're excited about in, in your own work? Yeah, so right now what I'm working on and what I actually did today was we're going to these dispensaries, um, you know, all over the country and we're working with those and we're trying to set up letter writing stations to write an inmate a letter writing a letter, a letter to an inmate is so important. I remember being on the bunk serving my four, uh, eight year sentence and uh, just getting that letter, man, it gives you something to look forward to. When you wake up, I mean, and the mailman comes and you got a letter and at the end of the day, you look forward to writing that letter and people give you, it gives you that sense of motivation towards that out date, you know? So mm. we're doing the letter writing system, educating people and especially like states like Missouri in the Midwest and these down south states, it's really important because you'll be surprised how many people are in state custody for just like a gram of marijuana, you know, or an eighth of marijuana. You know, it's so mind boggling. And a lot of these people come to dispensaries didn't know people are incarcerated. So we're trying to make sure that we're bringing awareness and we're maximizing the platform each state in each area that we're in and making sure that people are aware and understand that we're here to help and we're here to give you direction if you may not know where to go. Amazing, thanks so much. And Last Prisoner Project, we'll, we'll definitely make sure that that information get, you know, is posted throughout the event, great organization. Uh, well then, same question to you. I mean, uh, there was, I, I don't actually know how political you were before you went in, but obviously you've been all over the place since you came home. How does one, how would you recommend people plug in? You know, how, how do people start getting involved? And then is there a specific project that you'd recommend people get involved with? Yeah, definitely. I would tell people to definitely do their research and find organizations that are actually having an impact, such as Dream Corps, the Weldon Project, Last Prisoner Project. And I've actually been working with Dream Corps for five, six years. Um, and, you know, we worked on the First Step Act and got that passed. And that was an amazing coalition. So definitely do your research and, and find these organizations that are having a real impact and get behind them. Donate, volunteer your time. Um, and the specific project that we're working on that I would encourage individuals to get behind is the Cannabis Clemency Project. No one should be in prison for a cannabis offense, especially when we have these corporations and, and, and millionaires and billionaires making all this money off this plant while you still have people serving federal prison time, sometimes decades, for doing the same thing, violating the same federal statute. Um, and so we need all the help we can get. You can go to the weldonproject.org and, and learn how to get involved with Mission Green's Cannabis Clemency Project. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Weldon. Uh, is there anybody, so any of you have any sort of parting thoughts? Uh, you know, I, you know what, here, he'll be my last question. We, we have to make this one short and I'll just go around the horn, you know, Ruby, Dante and Weldon, you know, if you could imagine where we're going to be five years from now, once we've all been kicking ass and doing this work, where do you hope that we can get a criminal justice policy in the next five years? 
uh, in the next five years. I, I definitely would like to see the 18 men here uh, in the state of Arkansas that have life sentences for um, cannabis mm. uh, set free. Um, that would be a, a, a great goal for me to see within the next five years. Um, and beyond that is to just continue to do the work so we can make that happen. Fantastic. I think, yeah. um, I think okay. we're going to finally end the war on cannabis. And I believe, you know, maybe this year, you know, we're making a lot of progress, but if not in the next few years, I feel like we're going to end the federal ban on cannabis. Um, and then, you know, shift our work to the states because there's a lot of work to do um, and we need to end this war. And I think once we end the war on cannabis, I feel like the drug war will start to collapse. That's right. Yeah. Hopefully in the next five years, something like the MORE Act gets passed. I know the MORE Act is, you know, revamping back up and it's going to deschedulize it. So, I mean, hopefully in the next two or one, uh, five years is, you know, seems like a while, but, you know, even that's around the corner. But Hopefully we can see it where a plan is free and people are free. You know, that's what it's really about. So I encourage people to read about the MORAC, uh, get informed about it. I know Weldon knows a lot about it and we're just trying to encourage people to make a change. We got to start somewhere. And I believe we start with, you know, like I said before, you know, writing these legislators and expressing your view. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dante Westmoreland, Weldon Angelos, Ruby Welch, you're Outstanding leaders. We're so lucky to have you out in the field and uh, so lucky to have you with us tonight. Thanks a lot and we'll move, we'll move on to our next panel. Thank you. Appreciate you. So uh, next up, actually, before our second panel, we have a video to share with you. Uh, Representative Barbara Lee has been a champion for many years, longer than, than most of us have been in, in activism. She has been plugging away in Congress uh, on all kinds of issues that matter, especially ending the war on drugs. So we have a special message from her that we'd like to share with you now. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and I proudly represent California's beautiful 13th Congressional District, which includes Oakland and Berkeley, California. I'm also co-chair of the Congressional Cannabis Caucus. Now, I've been working on issues of racial justice for my entire life. And as we all know, cannabis policy is a racial justice issue. The war on drugs has unnecessarily ruined countless lives and a disproportionate amount of them have been people of color. We have been fighting for decades to reverse outdated, discriminatory and plainly racist federal marijuana policy. Marijuana has been racialized and stigmatized in this country for far too long. We have seen substantial progress toward cannabis justice in states across the country. My home state of California has been a true leader in this fight, but we have also seen re recently some unlikely states like Mississippi and South Dakota make critical reforms. It's long overdue to take cannabis justice now to the federal level. We are well on our way toward cannabis justice, thanks to the efforts of advocates like you. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. And yes, let's keep up the fight. All right. All right, well, thank you so much, Representative Lee. We'll now have our next panel about the war on drugs, the impact of the war on drugs on culture with our host and moderator, Warren Ballantine. Can he join us up here? Okay, I'm being told we're just uh, queuing up the next panel and it'll be ready to start in a minute. So uh, uh, so just so folks know how they can take action, tonight we're going to be uh, asking for people to take action on two things. Uh, you'll be hearing plenty about both later. One is the Equal Act, which is a congressional bill that is going to equalize the criminal penalties between crack and powder cocaine. I'm sure many of you know that years ago that ratio was 100 to 1 and is why we have so many people in prison for crack offenses for many years. And the other is going to be about clemency for people who are in federal prison for marijuana offenses. So uh, you might want to research that at any point later tonight, but we're going to be sharing lots of resources on it too. And uh, are we ready with the next panel?
All right, Warren Valentine, how you doing? What's up, Jonas? How's it going, everybody? Uh, fantastic. Always good to see you, man. You've got that smile and, and sunglasses combo. I can't help but get fired up when I see you, see you come on one of our programs. <laughs> well, you, you know, I wear the glasses because I actually had a cornea transplant. And so when I have too much light that comes in my eye, I get real bad headaches. So they're not actually sunglasses. They're actually oh, yeah. just tinted glasses. But uh, I do have some sunglasses as well. I can put them on for you, though, if you want me to. <laughs> you just keep wearing them after you're good. <laughs> so uh, this next panel up, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, you know, we're, we've heard from formerly incarcerated people. Uh, we're going to be hearing later from, we just heard from Representative Barbara Lee. We're going to hear from more former and current members of Congress soon. But we're going to have some special guests that you're going to talk to about how this is uh, this has been a cultural issue and we need cultural leaders like artists and athletes to step up and lead. So with that, I'm going to hand, hand it over to you, Warren, and take it away. Thank you, Yona, so much. I'm so happy to be here hosting this panel. Uh, I do a nationally syndicated radio show. Uh, you may hear me on other people's show, like Ricky Smiley, uh, The Morning Hustle. Uh, I do television, CNN, from the Black News Channel. I, I even did Bill O'Reilly's show for a long time. And I will tell you that uh, the impact of the criminal justice system, especially when you start talking about cannabis, is so big on the culture of who we are as a people that we have to have that conversation from the culture position. So I'm happy to be part of this uh, panel and moderating it. Um, and what I like to do with everybody on the panel is I like to let them introduce themselves, let them let them come on, and then I ask one question in the beginning that's kind of like a roundtable question, and then I'll ask one question at the end that's a roundtable question to kind of close out the panel. So. I'll start off with Brother Mike. Let you introduce yourself, Brother Mike. Good to see you, brother. Uh, good to be seen. Uh, my name's Michael Rinder, um, professionally known as Killer Mike. I'm Shay's husband. I'm one half of a group called Run the Jewels. And um, I'm a, a businessman. I own a group of swag shops or Shay Watson Groom Barber Shops. I'm heavily invested in stuff like real estate. And I co-own Bankhead Seafood with a good friend of mine named T.I. And um, I'm a product of, I'm a proud product of West Side Atlanta. And um, my ultimate goal is just to make sure that what if my grandparents invested in me, I make good on. Man, I love that already. I can't wait to talk to you, brother. Let's go to brother, <laughs> brother Keela. I, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, brother Keela. Yeah, how you guys doing today? Um, my name's Keone Kella. Um, I'm a pitcher for the San Diego Padres. My home base is Los Angeles, and I also work closely with um, the SJL group, which is a social justice league um, that covers the greater Los Angeles era and other places um, in the United States as well. And um, I'm just trying to utilize my platform and um, in hopes to, you know, help this prison reform and and just build awareness and visibility with my platform to get um, other like-minded individuals to speak out and, uh, you know, raise awareness. Brother, thank you so much for not just being with us, but actually saying something and speaking up. There's a lot of folks who say they want to be in the movement, but they're not really talking. So I appreciate that. Brother Cal, welcome to the show. Tell us about yourself. Thank you, Warren. Um, number one, I'm I'm excited to be on this panel with, uh, man, what, what an exciting group of people to be on with. Um, I have an eclectic background, um, born and raised in Southern California. Uh, I was in law enforcement for five years. I was a drug warrior. And for much longer than that, starting about 2007, I've been actively speaking out against the war on drugs, all drugs, not just cannabis. Um, on CNN, Fox, you know, from my experience of being in the middle of it as to why this is just awful. So, and, and right now I'm the founder, uh, co-founder, CEO of uh, the Glasshouse Group, which is one of the largest California cannabis companies and we're in the middle of going public right now. That's awesome, brother. That is that is so good. And that's part of the culture because so many of us went to jail for selling marijuana, but now we can't even get into selling marijuana. And that's part of the problem. So let's let's start off like this. The name of this panel is the impact on the culture. So that's gonna be the question for everybody. I'll start off with Brother Kyle. Since you were in law enforcement, I want to start off with you. What impact has this really had on black, brown, and even poor white people who are part of the culture dealing with selling marijuana, getting records and other things in your opinion? Oh, so um, 
I will tell you just my wife. My wife went to Carson High School. Keone, you may recognize that school because you, uh, you were there for a bit and you left it. Uh, and that, that area of town is much different than the area of town I grew up in where she had drug dealers down the street and she'd wave to them. And I was like, who are those guys? And she's like, oh, those are the so-and-so brothers. And I'm like, what do they do? Well, they sell drugs. And everybody in the neighborhood knew they sold drugs. The cops knew they sold drugs. And the neighborhood didn't see them as bad people. They just saw them as doing their business. In, in the area of town I grew up, that just never would happen. And so what I, what I found from my experiences were, you know, you arrest somebody for, you know, you put a case on them, they get a felony. They can't rent an apartment. Yep. They can't get a job. Yep. They can't yep. vote. They can't own a gun. You've just disenfranchised. You've taken away all the opportunities for somebody. So of course, what are they going to do? They're going to stay on the fringe and they're going to just, they're going to have problems throughout their lives because we've taken that away. And so we must end the war on drugs. I like that we're talking about cannabis because it's a great place to start since it's so the inequity, you know, I'm, I've, I'm working here on building a multi-billion dollar company violating the same exact laws. And I'm going to use the name Parker Coleman. Parker Coleman happens to be black. He has served 10 years. He has 50 to go for a nonviolent federal cannabis crime, which is basically under the same law that I'm violating right now. We've got to end this. And, and, and to answer your question more directly, Warren, it is a game changer to expunge all these records, give people a fresh start, and let's get, and also no more nonsense for new people. You know, I love that answer because of, of, of what you brought up. You brought up the fact that they can't get apartments. They can't rent homes. They can't get life insurance. And look, I'm somebody who practiced law for 15 years. I was in the courtroom it, across the country practicing law for 15 years. I was just with Ben Crump in New York for opening up his office in New York. And I can tell you this from that side of the ball game, the lawyers, the DAs, they know this is wrong, but nobody's speaking up about it. So brother mike let me say this man i've seen you all over the place fighting you what you're not just talking you're fighting and you dropping dimes and you dropping jewels when you see how this really is affecting the culture what's your opinion about all this um first let me start by saying free rollo uh, brother yes, sir. also known as terrell yes, sir. davis he's we're both from the west side of atlanta this brother um grew up in one of the roughest sections of my neighborhood and they say my neighborhood that side is pretty rough this brother went on to beat the streets and beat a lot of violence and became a rapper became a businessman bought the apartments he grew up in gave people who were recovering addicts jobs and because he chose to be a trailblazer much like joe kennedy and who sold alcohol when it was probate probated because he chose to be a trailblazer, much like the people who started NASCAR, who ran Moonshine. Yes, sir. Because he chose to be a trailblazer and be ahead of the curve in making sure that good marijuana made Taos out of town, he's now incarcerated. And as he's incarcerated, Georgia's opening up its marijuana laws medically, and eventually it'll be recreational. And if that man should serve days in jail, why people like my good friend over there, Kyle, just admitted I'm breaking the same laws. It'll just show that the inequities that's always held culturally people who look like me um, back. And I don't think that's fair. So I want to start by invoking Free Rallo. Um, a lot of people know me as of late as the child of a person who's a former police officer in Atlanta. But those who followed me from the beginning of my career know that my mother was a drug trafficker. She was an artist. Um, she was well known amongst the socialites in her community. And when I was 15 years old, two weeks before my birthday, I woke up to see my mother had been arrested for attempting to purchase 20 kilos of cocaine in Griffin, Georgia. So I have seen the entire spectrum from the people who were square in my family and never touched drugs to the people who were drug dealers in my family and helped fund businesses and stuff around. And I just like to say that we currently have a president who's in a big way responsible for many of the men and women that are incarcerated. Yes, sir. Um, people who look like me culturally have put him in office and Another federal holiday is nice to be acknowledged, but what would be nicer is to expunge the records of all the men and women you've sent to jail who suffer from some of the same diseases of addiction your own children and who will stand to profit like many of your friends who are now on the board of marijuana um, corporations. And I say that to a president.
who they would say some of my words helped get there. Um, I would like to challenge us as a country to stop waiting on politicians to do the right thing and understand that we celebrate the underworld in every way. My Jewish friends will tell me I have an uncle that was in the mafia with Dutch Schultz. My Italian friends will tell me of which one of their friends or dad's friends knew someone in the Bonanno crime family. But for some reason, when those crime stories go dark and they look more like me, there are people too who have been locked up for the rest of them lives. Somehow the crack era was the worst era ever and we don't get the opportunity to redeem ourselves. And I think that it's time that people who look like me give people who look like me a break and start to say, let's break the bullshit drug laws as they were. Let's give people who look like us an opportunity to come out of jail and become a business class first with marijuana. I believe first and foremost, marijuana can be in a, a place where quality starts to happen, where you, if we make up 35% of Georgia, then 35% of the marijuana trade should be controlled by people who look like hey, me. Amen. Georgia. Amen. 35% you know, of the place marijuana and hemp is grown should be. We should have land grants. The people who were in jail for nonviolent drug offenses should be released, and those people should make up the ownership, mid level management, and ground workers in that. But that only happens when we as a people deserve it and we demand what we deserve. That only happens before we send people like our latest congressman here. Um, before we send them up, we have to send them with the marching orders that fairness and equity doesn't just come from the benevolence of the president writing an executive order or somehow signing a federal bill. It happens when economically we're giving the same opportunities that we deserve. One of the most disgusting things I heard in the last two years was when Chuck Schumer, who had been a lifelong in opposition to marijuana, yep. I heard was in somehow involved either on the board of or in support of a company. And I thought to myself, how shameful that is. How many men and women have you saw go to jail for the rest of their lives, be robbed of an opportunity to be business people, to be parents, to be stalwarts in their community? How many people have been robbed of that? And just when it becomes legal, you get to pivot in. That's the 13th Amendment still stands that so long as, you know, you're not in prison, you can't be a slave. But if you go to prison, you can be a slave. So I just want to say that as a people, Americans, people who look like me in particular, who give our vote to one party, it is time that we start demanding right now, not in the future, not 10, 15 years, not we're not going to have to wait on a craft brewing renaissance how they did with beer and liquor and alcohol. <laughs> we should be demanding what's right from the top. So I appreciate what Kyle has to say. I'm looking forward to what to my brother Keller has to say over there. And um, I just thank y'all for being here. And I'll, I'll end it like I began it, man. Free Rollo and every, you know, free Fat Steve, free BG, you know, free these brothers. Let them come home. Free these sisters. Let them come home and let them participate in the business that they helped to build. Brother, I love this answer. And, and part of the reason I, I want to highlight this answer for everybody that's watching and who's going to be listening to this. Now, I'm going to say I'm going to give you something personal about me. I grew up in Inglewood in Chicago. I fought my way, paid to go to school, did everything right. I was nationally syndicated on the radio through Radio One. I had black people put a million dollars in Mechanics and Farmers Bank. Once I did that, the FBI met me in Atlanta at a at a SCLC event that I was hosting and speaking at, met me in the bathroom and said, we want you to work for us. When I refused to work with them, I then was criminally charged for a real estate closing that I did back in 2003. This is 2013, 10 years later, which I made $300. They charged me, took me through court, ruined my name, put me all in the newspaper like I was some big kingpin. My lawyer at the time, had Alzheimer's and I didn't know it, Charles Ogletree. And literally the judge won't even relook at my case. And this is, I'm like, what, what the heck is going on? I did everything I was supposed to do. I made $300, but this criminal system does not care if you're doing anything to help people, anything to change the matrix. They do not care if you do everything right. I will tell anybody this. This legal system is the new, not just Jim Crow, it is the new George Floyd. It is the new lynching system because they're using it to take people out. And this is why a brother like Keela is so, brother Keela, you're so important because your platform is so big as a professional ball player, somebody who has access to not just people, 
but economic opportunities. So tell us how the imp how this impacts the culture you come from growing up in Los Angeles. Um, specifically for me, you know, growing up um, in the Harbor area in Carson, Wilmington, Compton, Long Beach area, um, I've just seen so many of, of you know, my peers as well as, um, as I would call it, you know, OGs in a sense that um, have, have fell victim to the system. And so many times over, there have never been reparations in so many different um, facets for our community. And when we talk about equity and having established assets, as Brother Michael was talking about, or even you, Kyle, you guys are individuals that have equity. Right. And established right. assets as, as men who are who are on the free world. And, and like Killer Mike said, free Rallo, free my uncle Speedy, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we want to be able to bring these affluent individuals in the, in the mentals and be able to put them back into the into the to a space where like we talk about things are legal so we can build economic power so we can create turnover and jobs for our community and the reason that i wanted to jump on board in this conversation was to one utilize my platform to put myself um on the stage to hopefully where i can i can i can get a, a group of other athletes who will be willing to speak out because um man brother there's 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 a need for prison reform, there's a need for people to expunge all these enhancements that were placed on people, you know what I'm saying, of, of uh, from our culture, you know what I'm saying, who can be affluent and, and, and prolific individuals in our communities, you know what I'm saying, like each one teach one man, and, and there's a lot of people who are behind bars that could really reach, you know what I'm saying, reach a flock of, of, our, of our people. Tell and, me what? What's so dope about you even testifying on the behalf of saying the things that you say on your uncle is because I remember when Major League Baseball pulled out of the inner city. That's mm -hmm. right. Major League Baseball found the same genetics in the Caribbean that mm -hmm. they found in the inner city. Absolutely. And all of a sudden, all the Major League Baseball sponsored stuff shrank, just left the city. They they like the well, same we know why, right? Huh? Popular, we know why. Yeah, exactly. The same genetics for cheaper. They found the genetics for cheaper. So baseball, like golf and tennis, became an expensive endeavor. Yep. I would argue if it was not for the street hustler, the gambler, the pool hall owner, if it was not for the person who was a fan but was a business person, maybe to the mm -hmm. illegal, you wouldn't have black boys that participate. I know in Atlanta who, who sponsored the football and baseball mm -hmm. teams. It wasn't just the rappers and athletes. It was them brothers out there in the streets. It was them Chicago, boys, Chicago, the same way. And – and, and professional sports knows this. And I would think that we would do a better job as fans of encouraging. I just sat at a table with an executive producer who of big shows in Hollywood. He's a friend of mine, good brother. And all we did was yell and scream with each other at the table about baseball players. And I talked about how much I love Darren Strawberry, even though he, was, he played for the Mets, because they used to whoop the Braves. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a time where they could laugh at Darren Strawberry and say, well, your heroes do drugs. But because yeah. of players like you now, first of all, he was still a hell of a man and taught us to get our grades and we wanted to be like Darryl Strawberry. But it's players like you now, Keone, that have the ability to say, not only do I have this stage like Strawberry, you're not going to mock me. You're not going to play with me. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about freedom time and what's right and make it equitable. Yeah. So, you know, excuse me for chiming in like an well, uncle. Good. But I you're just got to say I'm proud of you and damn happy to be in solidarity with you. And I'm here as a resource, however you need me to get Absolutely. your money. You know what? Let me let me inject in just for one second because you just said something very important, Mike. We need to support this brother every possible way we can. Absolutely. We need to have your back more than than anything. I'm buying your jersey. Just know if you make a phone. I send you one. I send you one. But the one that I wanted to finish my I wanted to finish the point though was where where we have all these affluent individuals and then that's where we have men who are willing to break barriers um like Mr like Mr. Kyle um is doing you know where we can integrate and move vertically together you know what I'm saying like we have to we have to be willing to you know what I'm saying take the ten the tenacity of the streets and really make it corporate and then build globally Absolutely. You know, what I'm saying? that's not that's what we're not doing. You know, um, and it, to to and that's in my personal perspective. You know, my personal biased opinion. I just think that um, you know, me utilizing my platform, my social media outlets, and, and just pretty much plugging away and, and and drilling the scene. You know what I mean? We have to we have to let the, the get the word out. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So we because you never know. It may be that one person that could tip that scale. You know what I'm saying? And, and really, it's just a universal conscious situation where. You know, we, we can bring it all together if we just continue 
to have my generation because you guys, you know, I was born in 93. So I would say that we're the last of Mohicans that had some real core values kind of, you know, whooped into us a little bit, if you will. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we didn't get time out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just think that it's real important that we take a lot of those fundamental, um, you know, fundamental tools and those 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 pillars of principle and continue to force feed them to our youth. But we have to have those people who who didn't really, um, you know, they didn't do heinous crimes. You know what I'm saying? They were they were they were doing what they need to do to feed their family. Now, yep. if it's something outside of that that's killing your community, I can't sit here and, 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 and sit behind that. You know, but if it's some some weed where now we have, you know what I'm saying, Uncle Sam coming in and getting all the taxpayers' dollar and they getting tax taxation on, on 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 the on the weed and you know what I'm saying they're not doing anything truthfully uh, beneficial for the communities that it it's streamlining to. I mean that's a problem, you know. And, and really, like I said, I just want to utilize my platform and all the resources that I'm being acquainted with right now to amplify visibility of our initiative so we can grow and you know what I'm saying overcome and overstand. Um, the situation that that we're dealing with, you know. You know, I'm gonna say this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring you back in, brother Kyle. Just one second. We, you said something that's so important: equity. Because in the black community, we always talk about equality. Equality is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. But I explain that equity is what we need now more than ever. And I explain it this way: it's a very simple equation. I'm 6'1". If I'm trying to see over a fence that's 6'4", if you give me four inches, I can see over that fence. If you 5'10", and you get those same four inches, you still can't see. You got equality, because we got the same inches, but you need equity, because you need a little bit more to get up to where I'm at. We have to look at life like that. We have to be in a position where we create equitable things for all of us. Now, I'm going to say this for everybody that's on this panel and everybody who's participating today. I'm nationally on the radio. I would love to have y'all come on my show, give you a platform, talk about whatever you're doing, try to get people to support you in any possible way, because that's the key to me. The key to me isn't just let's have a conversation. The key is, no, I ain't gonna have a conversation with you. How can I help you? How can I, how can I pull you up? If I push you and you pulling me, when we go up the mountain, I'm not looking down and you're not looking up. We side by side. That's the way I see this as far as equity. So, Brother Cal, you got this great company about the lunch. And, and from what it sounds like, you're trying to create equity for everybody. So, so what I would tell you is, you know, so we, we're already a large company now. We're just about to go 11x. Oh, wow. Um, and I want to touch base on equity is the same thing. that When Keone said that, it caught my attention, too. When I was done with college, when I graduated, I spent four years working as a special education teacher in South Central Los Angeles. You guys might remember, Keone, you will not, but April of 1992 were the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. Yep. And I watched all the placation, I watched all the nonsense because I'd see all these ribbon cuttings as I'm driving to school, and then six months later, the ribbon's still on the ground, nothing happened. Politicians just placated the community, nothing happened. And there was no equity built in that community. We did talk about what happens if you get a felony on your record. You're not building equity, you're just trying to survive. Yep. But one of the things that's happening in Los Angeles and it's happening in some of the cities around the country is our social equity licenses. And so to me, we're a large retail already getting bigger. And the sad, the sad reality, and I'm sure everybody on this panel already knows, most of the people that lead cannabis companies and run cannabis companies that have invested in cannabis companies look like me. And that is not building any wealth in, and I can give you statistic after statistic, I even wrote them down from my head, how bad it is for poor communities, which are mainly black and brown. And so one of the things that's important is when, when in Los Angeles, they will issue, I think they're gonna issue 200 retail licenses to people that have been arrested for a marijuana um, offense and make less than about $50,000 a year. They give them a license and say, go. go. Go get a retail location, go get this, run a retail store, go find product. So we're, we are actively talking to some of those folks that have received the licenses because to me, and social equity, those two words are, it's like two loaded words. If you watch MSNBC, they mean one thing. You watch Fox, they mean another thing. But to me, social means we're giving a license to somebody who came from an area 
that was harmed by the war on drugs. And equity is building wealth. And a lot of us have had that opportunity. I've had that opportunity my whole life to build wealth. And so that to me, to me, a, shel a retail shelf is a retail shelf is a retail shelf as the CEO of a public company. But when it comes down to actually, it, it does mean a lot to those folks if we can go ahead and bring them on in and work together to build some stores around, around LA, around Oakland, around San Francisco, where the beneficiaries are not just me, but folks that need to bring that wealth back into those communities and also for themselves and their families. Let me, let me do this because we got about literally about eight minutes left, guys. So this is going to be the closing question. Uh, and so I'll, I'll do the round table like we did in the beginning. Uh, literally, I'll start off with you, Brother Mike. What's the one thing could happen, in your opinion, that might, might just change the culture a little bit? Um, the same thing Dr. King was talking about his last two years of life, the same way that you gave Europeans who immigrated to America chances through land grants, um, through the same thing you gave them through loan programs, zero interest, the same thing that GI Bill has done, the same thing that redlining, um, had it not been used, would have it would have would have have been out of the way for. That's the chance for African Americans to have a true chance. I'll use my state for an example. Georgia is 35% African American. There are only, I think, six and five licenses up at different divisions. Mm -hmm. I think that 35% of those licenses should be guaranteed to have to be African American. I think that 35% of the growing grants should be given to African American farmers and landowners. I think that there are people who have state um, state um, charges that are nonviolent drug offenses should be freed and they should be given first choice to be in the business that they have helped to build in the same way that moonshiners got it and went on to build NASCAR in the same way that liquor distributors went on to form essentially a mafioso that doesn't allow for new distributors to happen. I think that African-Americans deserve that preferential treatment. Marijuana was illegalized on the back of using jazz music as an excuse. It put black, <laughs> it put white women and black men and jazz bands together, caused yeah. it to do things. It was amazing. And when you go back and look at Reefer Madness and realize the racism that was employed to get these things to happen, I think that the only way you reverse that is not only freeing people from jail, not only saying we're sponge your records, but give them priority and preference and preferential treatment to be a part of the business that they've helped build. I think Amen. that's the beginning. That's not even the end all but definitely help me get my money up and control my own commerce in my community is a great first step. Amen, brother. I completely agree with that 100%. Uh, brother Keone, let's, let me ask you the same question. What, can, what do you think would help the culture? Not, it's not going to change it wholeheartedly like Brother mm -hmm. Mike just said, but what's the beginning? Um, just in my, my, for one is to have, um, like you said, like to chime in on what Brother Mike said, is to um, be given grants be given opportunities to um, have land to where community and cultural uh, programs can be built to help build value for the community so there can be ownership. Because not not only do we love uh, equity or having assets, but true ownership. And when I mean ownership is also be able to teach individuals how to, how to tend to the land, how to water, how to water the land, how to allow the sun to, you know, to properly shine on the land because then we get into the spectrum of talking about taking care of the human body when you're following in those acts. You know what I'm saying? And it's much greater than just, you know, oh, we need to give back just for the monetary purpose of, you know, the cannabis. It's about restructuring and rebuilding the community just as a seed that we're all fighting about. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. like like Pac said, man, you know, the rose that grew from concrete, people marvel, yes, people yes, marvel at, at the beautiful flower that, that came through the rubble and all that that struggle man and that's what that's what i feel like our culture embodies and being that everything in the culture at to this point is being driven by the culture i do i too um agree that the culture should have you know um you know some type of ownership or equity into rebuilding um value into the communities as well as um giving opportunities for for our local um you know our local individuals Brother, I love the pot quote. I say that all the time when I'm speaking at, at graduations. I always tell the kids, uh, I always say I'm the rose that grew up in the concrete and I, you mm -hmm. are too. You just got to realize you that rose because mm -hmm. there's something different and special about you. Brother Cal, how, how, do, how do we take the first step to help the, help the culture? So, so I love what Mike, I love what Keone said. Um, I'm not going to 
I'm not going to go right where they went because I think they already made the great points. I am going to follow up on one of Mike's earlier comments about we all know somebody in our families, our friends, and I love the subtle reference to our president because we're all there. They yeah. have drug use, 100%. And I'll, I'll give you some statistics real quick. Every 25 seconds, somebody in this country is arrested for a drug crime, 25 seconds. So I would tell you, quite frankly, if, if the politicians didn't hear the people rioting and see it, there's anger out there, palpable anger, no more placation. Take drugs out of law enforcement. Make it a health issue. You know, in, in my state of California, which a lot of people feel like, hey, it's Cali, you know, we're, we're a different, you know, we're liberal, it's all good. Mike has a four times more chance of being arrested for cannabis than I do. Four times. And there's a lot more of me than there are of him. So it's a, we've got to end the drug war. And I know we keep saying it, we need to demand action because also that will heal. We do need law enforcement in this, in this country or else we have anarchy. We need to rebuild that bridge into peace officers in the community. The drug war, that is not it. We have Breonna Taylor because of a drug war. If that, yep. if we had no drug war, Amen. Breonna would be alive today. So that's that's my first step, but but they, they made great points. So again, when you guys come out, Mike, Keone, I know you're in LA, come talk to me because we are looking for ways to to bridge gaps, to build equity. We We will win, in my opinion, and do just fine, but others can win with us. Brothers, I want to thank all three of you. This has been a very special uh, panel to me. I'm going to close this out like this. These brothers all have given great information, great points. Follow them, support them. Again, I'll extend anything I can do to help anybody. It's done. You can get my information. It's done. Uh, I'll close it out like this. We got about a minute left, so I'll close it out like this. Uh, as we look at everything that's happening and what's going on, I did, I did an interview when Joe Biden, right after he signed the, the federal holiday, and somebody asked the question. They said, well, Warren, what does this mean? I said, well, this may be the most influential federal holiday in American history only because when you had, look at a federal holiday, you have to learn about why they made it a federal holiday. I said, this allows black history not to be a race, which they're trying to do about slavery and other things. I said, but more importantly, this should show everybody, especially black and brown people, that this administration, if they wanted to, could make it where these nonviolent felons, a records could be erased, no fines and fees, everybody who's arrested for cannabis could walk out of jail with no record tomorrow. But I think Mike said it best. And I think Cal and Keone jumped right on it and, and I agree with them all. We need equity, but we also need priority. We need ownership. We need to be the ones that's part of this because literally, we're the ones that went to jail for this, but now that you can make money, you want to legalize everything. Imagine that, only in America. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you guys. Please. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to pass it over to Brandon, my brother Brandon. Nice Mo, job, you Brandon. The channel. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate Mike. you, brother. Thank you, Mike, guys. Kyle. See Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Good show. Thank Peace. you, Jonas. Hey, thank you, Warren. Thank you, that amazing panel we just had. Right before our next panel, our next panel is going to be talking about federal cannabis policy. We have another video we want to play for you. Uh, Representative Earl Blumenauer has been a leader on the fight to end the war on drugs for decades. That's why he and Barbara Lee are the two people that we asked to share videos with us today. Representative Blumenauer has been with us since the beginning in this fight, and I couldn't, couldn't have this event without him sharing his reflections not only on how far we've come, but what we have to look forward to, to ending the drug war in the next few years. So enjoy this video from Representative Blumenauer from Oregon. Well, this program is taking place at an amazing time in the history of cannabis reform. We've seen more progress in the last Congress than ever before. The public is with us in greater numbers than ever before. And we have an emerging cannabis industry it's going to be worth about $20 billion this year and employ over 350,000 people. But most important, the people understand that it's time to end this failed war on drugs. They're on our side and we have an agenda that is popular and practical. The Equal Act is an example. We look at 
legislation around the country that is moving in this direction. People recognize the inequality, the unfairness, and the need to be able to wipe the slate clean. That's another reason that I'm optimistic about the progress in this Congress and in states around the country. Thank you for your attention and interest, and I look forward to working with you as we get this across the finish line in this Congress. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining. My name is Brandon Bolton. I am the Director of Social Equity at Project Mission Green, founder of the United Core Alliance, and Social Equity Specialist at Cookie Social Impact Program. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today uh, as we discuss you know, what policy steps uh, that we can all take to end cannabis prohibition. I'm honored to be sharing space today with my fellow panelists. These are extraordinary social justice warriors who've dedicated their lives to social justice and community of colors across the nation. Uh, we're fairly limited on time, so I'll have the panelists briefly introduce themselves and we'll get straight into some questions. Uh, Weldon, we've heard from you a bit earlier. Uh, that was such a wonderful, wonderful panel um, with you, Dante, as well. That was incredible. Uh, so I'll go ahead and have Natalie uh, introduce herself. Uh, she is the Director of Strategic Initiatives uh, at Last Prisoners Project. Uh, she's founded her own nonprofit organization that works with lawmakers, public officials, and community organizers to advance just, effective, and, and uh, cannabis policies related to criminal justice reforms. Natalie, go ahead, take it away. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is gonna be a great conversation. Um, like Brandon mentioned, I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at The Last Prisoner Project. And um, basically what I do there is work on our federal policy initiatives, um, including one that Weldon and I will be talking about later today, which is um, a federal cannabis clemency push. So really excited to um, sort of dismantle the drug war on this, you know, rather sordid and sad anniversary, um, starting with cannabis policy and then eventually expanding to all sorts of different substances and practices. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so grateful for your work. You know, as a social equity entrepreneur myself, these policies directly impact uh, myself and my community members' future in the cannabis space. Um, I'm also very, very honored to introduce uh, Representative Kwanzaa Hall. Uh, he has been in politics for over 20 years, becoming elected to Atlanta's Board of Education and City Council, where he focused on community improvement initiatives, to his most current role as Congressman in Georgia's 5th Congressional District, filling the seat left by civil rights leader, Congressman John Lewis. He is recognized by his work in areas such as economic inclusion and workforce development, and is recognized by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation for his initiatives to provide resources to families living in poverty. It's great to have you. I'll go ahead and have you introduce yourself. I know I, I did a bit of introduction right there, on, even on my own. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. That was a great introduction. I don't think I need much more. I want to get into the pain on the conversation, but I'll just say it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a former city councilman, school board member, and congressman, so I've seen uh, this issue at various levels of, uh, of need in our community. And I think we're at a very unique moment in our country's history, and it's up to us, the people on this call, and those who are listening to figure a strategy on how we strike the iron while it's hot to move, move this agenda forward. Well, let's get right into it. I, I incredibly agree with you. Uh, you know, there's lots of bills actually at the federal level that are you know, looking at passing on the floor. Uh, one which really stands out is the MORE Act. You know, the MORE Act, which stands for Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement, recently passed with 24 to 10 majority 
by the House Judiciary, Judiciary Committee, uh, this bill would deschedule cannabis from controlled substance act from the Controlled Substance Act and enact various criminal and social justice reform related to cannabis. Uh, Natalie, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are your thoughts on the MORE Act? Uh, can it be improved currently, or do you feel it's great as it is? Well, I, I'm of the opinion that most any piece of legislation can always be improved. Um, but I do think the MORE Act is an incredible first step. You know, this is a pretty groundbreaking piece of legislation. It's the first sort of major effort and successful effort in that it passed through um, one chamber of Congress to deschedule cannabis on the federal level, which it's been sort of a schedule on drugs since 1971. And I do think that the supporters as well as the drafters of the MORE Act have really prior prioritized retroactive relief for people who are still you know, incarcerated or suffering the collateral consequences of federal cannabis related convictions. That said, I do think that there is the desire, the, the will of the American people want to see federal legislation go further to be more expansive, to make sure there's accountability with the government authorities who would be tasked with implementing these expungement provisions with these resentencing motions. And so I look forward to working with policymakers um, to make sure that the letter of the law really aligns with the spirit of it, because I think there's a real desire um, for retroactive relief. We just need to make sure our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted. Yes. Uh like I agree with you, policy can always be a bit better. Uh, I'll also leave that question open. Uh, Weldon, would you like to kind of give your thoughts as well? Yeah, I, I agree with Natalie. I think um, the MORAC can definitely be improved, but it is a great bill. It's, a, uh, it's an important piece of legislation, and we look forward to you know helping get more Republican support. Um, I think there are some issues with the MORAC that are <clears throat> extremely important, such as individuals that have ancillary charges. Um, being, you know, formerly incarcerated myself and being charged with a marijuana offense, you know, I know firsthand that nearly everyone charged in a marijuana case also has money laundering, um, and a lot of times they have other charges, and those individual charges will not be expunged um, under the MORE Act, and so there's still a lot of work to do. Um, but I think, you know, it's good. It's, it's definitely, um, you know, an amazing piece of legislation. Definitely. And Mr. Hall, how about yourself? Yes, I absolutely agree with everything that's been said. When I was uh, in Congress, I supported the 2020 version of the MORE Act. So I, I think uh, this is the best that we can get over the finish line. And sometimes, you know, you can't let things like this throw you off, even though it's not perfect as legislation in our communities. We, we fight about legislation, but this is a good piece. In addition to it, I think the next thing is to challenge all of our state and local governments, county, County jails, city jails house many more people than people at the federal level. And those are the folks whose uh, charges need to be also expunged. Their records need to be need to be clean and they need to be given some type of financial restorative justice to get back into society after having basically lost all of their lives. In many cases, lost their families, their homes, their children. And so we, we've got to do some connective work around bringing families and children back together who were impacted by this. And I think that should be an addition that we charge local governments to do for those who receive any type of federal funds. That could be a way to kind of have a carrot and a stick to ensure that it happens. I agree. And I think that's great to point out that this fight, you know, is on the federal, state and local level, you know, when it comes down to it. And that's something that we are going to get into. But Weldon, you pointed out, you know, something that you're doing and focusing on is getting uh, bipartisan support. Um, you know, let me ask this. Uh, how do we get bipartisan support to end cannabis prohibition, you know, on the federal level? How do we get those Republicans and, you know, just unlikely allies to come in and support us on this mission? Yeah, well, we can't cut with one scissor blade. So we need Republicans if we want to end prohibition on the federal level. And I think there was a lack of federal, uh, of Republican engagement for, for a long time. And they've sort of been left out of the process. And so I decided to try to launch uh, Cannabis Freedom Alliance. And the purpose of Cannabis Freedom Alliance is to start engaging Republicans. You know, this is an issue that falls within their principles. And there's in, people like Mike Lee and others that we've reached out to, you know, are supportive. And I think they just need to be need to be engaged. And so we can't get there without it. You know, we only got 50 votes. I may not even have 50, may have 49. So we're going to need at least, you know, 10 to 12 Republicans. And so I think, you know, Republican engagement is key if we really want to, you know, end prohibition. 
No, agree. I agree with you. And so I'd like to ask you, Mr. Hall, like going back to, you know, the local and state level fights, uh, in your opinion, once the MORE Act is passed and federal cannab cannabis prohibition is ended on the, at the federal level, what's the fight at the state and local level, given that the MORE Act doesn't force the states to legalize, you know, and really opt into everything that's within that bill? Well, we could, I, I added a piece of legislation and it could be added in the future that says any city or county or state that receives federal funds is required to apply the same rules. If they receive justice dollars, if they receive health and human service dollars, any type, infrastructure dollars, and then now you make it a business case. And also, many of the individuals who are incarcerated are entrepreneurs. This is really about free enterprise. I've seen so many individuals who come out of the justice system and they've created careers for themselves. They created companies that are employing hundreds, if not you know, almost up to a thousand people in some cases, restaurants and tech companies. So we're really talking about bringing the entrepreneur class out of out of the, the dungeons and back into society and allowing them a chance to create jobs. And I think that also speaks to Weldon's point about um, how we, we reach out to the Republican base and get them to understand that this is a positive thing because we're really talking about people lifting themselves up who just were entrepreneurs before uh, it was legal. And I think on the previous panel, uh, many mentioned Joe Kennedy and others who, who were doing illegal activities and then they ended up um, in the alcohol business later. Same could be true in this case. Oh. Definitely. I agree with you. And there's, uh, you know, speaking of expungements, you know, on the local level, that's something that uh, we're actually doing here locally. I'm based out of Sacramento, California. Uh, we're actually, you know, we're three expungements in, you know, we're learning how to properly do these expungements and how to, you know, take this from our community to many others because we're finding out there's such a need for this, you know, and that's stemming, you know, that's our local level fight that we're starting to see as well. And so, Natalie, I'd like to ask you the next question. Uh, what do you think are some of the stigmas slash issues that are holding politicians back from advancing policies that would end uh, cannabis prohibition? And how do we get buy-in and convince those policymakers to support us on this mission? You know, um, I'm a strong believer in the fact that people do what they're incentivized to do. And right now, um, politicians are incentivized to uphold a status quo, even though we know the status quo is not working for anyone. You know, DPA and the ACLU actually just came out with a poll a few days ago showing that the vast majority of Americans believe the war on drugs has been an abject failure. And yet we continue to, tr you know, funnel billions of dollars into it each year because inertia is really, really powerful. But the thing that will counter inertia is when constituents start calling, start showing up, start demonstrating their support for a common sense public health approach to cannabis policy, drug policy, policing, the criminal legal system, um, because politicians are incentivized to listen to their constituents. Um, that's how you keep your job. That's how you sort of continue to do the career path that you've been set um, up to do. So it's really, you know, not to sound too kumbaya, but it's really up to us as citizens, as voters to make our voice heard um, and show that if you don't stand for you know, what the, the will of the people, what the American populace wants, you no longer will be representing us. And I think that's that's kind of the key. Uh, that's incredible, incredible answer. And I think that's what we're seeing with the development of a lot of these, you know, local organizations, these community driven social equity organizations. We're starting to see a lot more of these building and, and building coalition. You know, we just uh, a couple weeks here in California, uh, we saw the California Cannabis uh, Equity Coalition form at the state capitol here in Sacramento. And that was, you know, those efforts of members of the communities you know, advocating for policies that they need to see moving forward. So I incredibly agree with you, Natalie, on that. Weldon, would you like to speak to that as well? How do you how do you think we should get buy in from uh, some of those Republicans and Democrats? Yeah, I think we just need to educate them. Um, the majority of Republicans, you know, this fits within their principles of, you know, um, states rights. You know, it's interesting. We had a conversation with a very prominent Republican senator and, you know, surprisingly, you know, he pretty much supported everything in the MORE Act. Um, I think there were a few regulatory issues, um, but, you know, we're going to have to compromise. There are some issues, you know, in the MORE Act, like the 
uh, uh, what is it? The the the, me the funding mechanism um, is something that you know no Republican senators are going to vote for. So I think we're going to have to find you know ways to compromise and really sell this as a states' rights uh, piece of legislation. Agree with you. I agree with everything you're all saying, of course. <laughs> I'd like to kind of get into our final question here. Um, and this is actually to, to all of the panelists. So, you know, you guys go ahead and answer uh, as you please. Uh, how can people out there, you know, join the push to end cannabis prohibition? I know we've all kind of been mentioning all of that throughout our answers, but what would you say, you know, could be your call to action for the members out there watching this that want to get, you know, get behind their communities and support uh, BIPOC individuals, um, you know, break into the cannabis space? I, I'll, I could uh, popcorn as well. If you if you like, <laughs> Mr. Hall, Mr. Hall, go ahead and have you have you answer that if you if you like. Let me just piggyback on Weldon real quick on the states' right. So many states that have passed uh, decriminalization and also that have passed medical marijuana and legalization have had Republican leaders who supported these measures. So we've just got to figure out how to thread the needle because Georgia passed medical marijuana. And so, so we're moving forward with Republican support as a Republican legislature. We've got to figure out how to craft the same narrative and dialogue around our restorative justice. So I think all groups that are doing, and we've got a variety of groups all over the country who are doing local restorative justice, you can get involved at the school level. There are students who've been impacted uh, before 18 by the war on drugs. There are uh, individuals at your your municipal level, know your elected officials, know who your school board members are, know who your, your council members, your mayor, your state representatives, and begin to dialogue with them. Social media makes it so easy for us to reach out and begin the conversation. And oftentimes they don't know, they're very busy. And until, as Natalie mentioned, you raise the caliber of the conversation, you raise the volume, they don't hear. You don't have to be mean, you don't have to be uh, destructive in your outreach, but you can get their attention. And once you get their attention, that starts uh, the ball rolling in our direction of solving this terrible problem that we're dealing with right now. Awesome answer. Thank you. I mean, I obviously agree with everything that's been said. I think one thing that I personally have found to be really productive is educating, whether it's your friends, your family, your community, about the history of marijuana prohibition in the U.S. Because this isn't simply a case of good policy gone bad. This policy from its inception was not meant to serve the public's health. It was meant to serve as a form of social control. And in that way, it's been incredibly successful, much to the detriment of our society. And so when you go back and you understand sort of the history of cannabis usage in this country, you know, at one point, colonial settlers were compelled to grow the plant. Um, and then, you know, several hundred years later, it became one of the most uh, draconian punishments um, in, in, in the entire nation. And when you see why that happened, it was not because of medical necessity. It was not because of like a, a pan an epidemic. It was because of sort of perverse aims. You start to really interrogate why we're upholding these very racist and xenophobic policies um, in the first place. Well then. You know, we're, you're doing a lot of initiatives. One thing I know we're working on right now is a commissary program. Uh, would you like to kind of explain that commissary program? I know that's something that we're actually uh, launching this week, um, I believe on Friday. Would you like to give a little bit of insight uh, to that and how Project Mission Green uh, is helping those who are currently incarcerated? Uh, yeah, definitely. So first I wanna say, you know, there's nothing more important than freedom. And so our main goal and our reason for existing is to end incarceration for marijuana. Uh, it was the whole reason why I decided to launch Mission Green, seeing these entrepreneurs, you know, predominantly white older men making millions off the cannabis and seeing individuals in prison, predominantly people of color, you know, serving decades, you know, despite both violating the same federal statute. So, you know, freedom is our number one goal. But while we're working to get people out of jail, um, they should be as comfortable as possible. You know, individuals who are in there for cannabis related offenses, you know, are, are for something we no longer considered criminal. Um, we should be making them as comfortable as possible. And so we are launching a cannabis program uh, for individuals who are serving time for cannabis to fund their commissary accounts so they're as comfortable as possible. A lot of people don't know that the federal prison system does not feed people enough 
to keep you full. They only feed you enough to keep you alive. And a lot of times you're not provided the basic necessities. For instance, women aren't provided tampons, you know, basic necessities. And we've heard stories of some of the women haven't used toilet paper because they rather spend that money on a phone call to call their kids or to call their parents on a holiday. And so this is, is extremely important. You know, the industry has to step up and look out for the people who paid the ultimate price and whose stories enabled them to make their fortunes in the first place. And I'm honored to participate in that program as well, uh, being Cookie's social impact program, being the sponsor for that. And we're looking for, uh, you know, a lot more help to, you know, really help a lot of those incarcerated folks until we can in Canterbury's prohibition and bring all these folks home. So once again, I'd like to thank all of the wonderful panelists for joining us today. Um, I'd like to allow you guys to all say any final thoughts if you'd like. If you have any Instagram, any social medias you'd like the folks to follow or any call to actions you'd like the folks to, to go ahead and. Uh, yeah, I'll go. Um, if anyone wants to get involved with, um, you know, ending cannabis incarceration, they can follow us on Instagram at Project Mission Green, or they can go to our website at theweldenproject.org and learn how to get involved. We have some very exciting uh, projects and events in the future, and we're organizing the hip hop community to really step up and get involved in helping us end this war. I will plug something that I know is dear to both um, Lost Vision Project and Weldon and his team's heart, and that is federal cannabis clemency. So um, one of the things that we're both pushing for is for President Biden to use his sort of unilateral power to release those currently incarcerated for cannabis-related um, convictions. And so cannabisclemency.org, you can head there, you can learn a little bit more about a systematic approach to ensuring the release um, and the retroactive relief for people formerly incarcerated. Um, and it's really as easy as sort of signing your name to a petition. Um, we can make enough noise um, to get the president's attention. And I really welcome you all to join us in that endeavor. Couple of things. One, I'd like to thank all of the elected officials who've been supportive of the measures that we're speaking about. Oftentimes they do good work, but we don't celebrate them enough. So that's number one. Number two, I wanna say uh, big support for the Last Prisoner Project. And speaking of one person in particular, uh, Rallo, who is a rapper, an artist from Atlanta, Georgia, who's still incarcerated and we're fighting for his freedom. But there's uh, freedom that is need to be won for a lot of individuals around the country, really around the world for that matter. So let's all just double down on our efforts and continue to fight the good fight because we're not fighting in vain. Thank you all for having me. And thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye everyone. All right, well, thank you all so much for that really uh, great panel. We've had three amazing ones and now we have three incredible folks that are joining us for our final panel about solutions to ending the war on drugs from three people who have been uh, leaders in, in, in different ways. And I'm really excited to, to bring them up with me. We have uh, the district attorney of Los Angeles, George Gascon. We have representative Kelly Armstrong from North Dakota, and we have civil rights leader Nikiji Taifa, um, who are gonna all be up with us in a minute. Hey, how's it going? Uh, good, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you flying. Are the other panelists here? I'm here. This is somebody else. I'm, there, there I'm we go. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, see everyone. The chat was in the way. We, we had a, a minor hiccup there. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, I see the DA, we're, we're still trying to get his screen on, but let's just jump right in because like I mentioned, I introduced all, all three of you before and, and you can introduce yourselves better than anybody. So. Um, let's start with you, Representative Armstrong. I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you with us. I'd love for you just to take a couple minutes to talk about 
your journey from being a defense attorney to member of Congress and how this issue has been important to you through the years and, and what you're working on now in Congress to end the war on drugs as we know it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, I I was a federal public defender for 10 years. Uh, pri I did private criminal defense all across the state of North Dakota, uh, did what we call overfull of public defense in North Dakota. So I've been a part of draconian sentencing and sentencing guidelines and how that works. Uh, we, we obviously didn't have crack as much as we had methamphetamine. It's just a regional issue. But uh, and prior to that, I served as the chair of the state of the chairman of our Senate Judiciary Committee in the state as we did a ton of criminal justice reform, pretrial release, some decriminalization of marijuana, medical marijuana is uh, legal in North Dakota. I don't think people think of a state like North Dakota like that, but from listening to your last panel, um, we can tell that there's a lot of this going on. So this is something I have worked on in the courtroom and the natural transition is to try and do it at the federal level. Absolutely, well, we'll come back to you in just a minute to talk about the Equal Act and other important bills that are going on. Uh, District Attorney Gascon, it's so great to have you with us. You know, when you think about your bio as somebody who started off as a patrol officer, came chief of police, DA of San Francisco, you've seen the war on drugs in many iterations. And I was wondering if you'd shout your own journey, sort of experiencing it from those different perspectives and, and where you think we are now. No, you know, much like uh, like uh, Congressman Armstrong, you know, I, I was a participant in the war on drugs, you know, early stages of policing, you know, going through the ranks. And, and for me, it really came to a point as I, as I uh, became more uh, aware of my surroundings, if you will, and, and the results of our work, you know, I increasingly became uh, convinced that what we were doing wasn't working. You know, I was seeing one generation after another generation, so the people that we were dealing with, you know, just going through a revolving door, uh, you know, really began to become very aware of the, the impact of systemic racism in the system, uh, the impact that it had, you know, in African Americans and Latinos as opposed to the rest of the population. The fact that drug use in this country is uh, pretty much across racial, uh, ethnic, social, economic lines. But yeah, the people that, were, that we were arresting and the people that were prosecuting uh, were mostly black or brown people. And that really started my journey uh, to be where I am today, uh, you know, first of all, working with the state council, uh, part of the Justice Center, looking for justice reinvestment, working around the country and trying to reduce the population levels all the way to becoming the district attorney in San Francisco, where, you know, by that time I was completely committed to reducing mass incarceration and showing that we could lower crime and, you know, being a sponsor of Prop 47 here in California, which was one of the major uh, decriminalization process where we took uh, the use of drugs, uh, reducing most, you know, the possession for personal use to misdemeanors and moving on. Great. Well, thank you so much for that leadership. And Nikichi, uh, I'll kick it to you next. You know, earlier tonight, we saw videos from Representative Barbara Lee and Representative Blumenauer, two people who have been at this issue a long time. And I think of you in that category of people who are working on these issues when they were definitely not popular. And I would love to hear from you. You know, how do you feel looking back on the last two decades? You know, how much, how much progress do you think we've made and, and how much further do you think we have to go in the area of drug policy? Well, thank you very much. And you're correct. I really have a long view of the criminal punishment system, having been in the trenches really for the past nearly four decades from the mid 80s, working on uh, prison reform to the late 80s as an attorney in private practice, representing indigent um, clients, primarily uh, uh, drug offenses to um, uh, the early 90s, fighting all those omnibus crime bills that were popping up every single year, culminating in what I call the granddaddy of all the crime bills, the crime bill of 1994, where both Republicans and Democrats were very, very bad on these uh, issues. And that was the beginning of my advocacy against the disparity between uh, crack and, uh, and, and powder cocaine to then the late 90s teaching uh, law students at Howard Law School about these uh, abuses, then bringing us into the turn of the century, uh, working with respect to the Prison Rape Elimination Act uh, that passed in 2002, the uh, 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 Second Chance Reentry Bill that passed in 2008, the Fair Sentencing Act, which reduced the disparity between crack and powder cocaine, which uh, passed in um, uh, 2010, working on the Obama era clemency initiatives to ensuring that sentencing provisions were 
a part of the uh, First Step Act. So I kind of do have a long view of the system fighting in the trenches. And I have seen a lot of changes in that time from tough on crime to kind of like, shall we say, smart on uh, uh, safety. And I'm looking forward to what is going to be coming in the future and what's on the plate today. Absolutely. Well, let, well let's talk about one of those bills. Um, Representative Armstrong, you're a co-sponsor of the Equal Act, uh, which you, know, you heard Nikichi reference uh, the crack powder disparity, which was at one point 100 to 1, now 18 to 1, if I'm not mistaken. Can you talk a little bit about that bill and also the fact that, you know, when I look at bills in Congress that actually have some momentum, some bipartisan support, you know, that's that's a real one. And I'd love you just to share a little bit about what, what drew you to being a sponsor of it and how you feel it could potentially pass in the next year. Sure. I think probably more than most people in Congress, I have a real idea how federal drug, drug crimes work. I've uh, been the defense attorney on numerous of them. And so one of the things about the disparity is obviously there's the disparity. And it went from, like you said, 100 to 1. And the first step back did a lot of great things. But, you know, just this week we had a 9-0 Supreme Court decision on prior, prior offenses dealing with crack. But I think the real issue is it hits you twice, right? most of your federal drug crimes are gonna be minimum mandatory crimes. So instead of 500, it's 20, 200, or five kilograms, it's 280 grams. But then if you have any prior criminal history, you know, your last panel was talking about marijuana, which you have three misdemeanor marijuana convictions between your 18th and your 20th birthday, you get yourself into a criminal level three. Not only do you have the minimum mandatory disparity, but you have the sentencing guideline disparity, which can be absolutely exponential as you continue to move through this. And there's nothing inherently different about it. There's nothing, I mean, there's cost, there's con con there's cost, there's composition and all of that. But when we talk about the dangers of it in federal sentencing, there is the enhancements for firearms. There's all of these other things that attach. So that argument just doesn't hold water to me and we should move it forward. I mean, if you're 22 years old and you're getting a 10 year minimum mandatory in federal court, the extra 36 months on a sentencing guideline to me is draconian. It always will be. So, Absolutely. And you're feeling reason how uh, let me not lead you uh, are you how are you feeling about the, uh, the the viability of the bill given that look it's no secret think congress things are a little dicey right now but although you've been a leader on this sort of bipartisan effort on criminal justice yeah, it's bicameral. It's bipartisan. I'm really excited to have Senator Portman and Congressman Jeffries on it because that brings chops and leadership on both sides of the issue. Um, and I, I mean, we're going to keep pushing it. It should pass. Uh, you have that whole. Here's why I like it in the House. You have that whole group who worked through really hard, hard, hard negotiations before I got there. So I'm giving everybody credit on the First Step Act. And so they've worked with each other before, they trust each other before. So even in what is a pretty toxic time in DC right now, I'm really hopeful we can get it moving forward. I'm hopeful as well. Thank you, Congressman. Nikichi, uh, you, you, you got your hand in a whole bunch of different really important bills. Do you wanna talk about which ones you feel like have momentum even in this tough environment that you would really like to uh, get through relating to drug policy? Or, I mean, we can expand it out on criminal justice more broadly if, you, if there's not a particular drug policy one that you, you lean into. So I would say to, with respect to some important bills, other than Equal Act, which we spoke to, other than the marijuana bills, which I know you have spoken to uh, uh, before, uh, there's a triad of bills being considered right now uh, by Senate, uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, the COVID-19 Safer Detention Act, we have the First Step Implementation Act, we have the Prohibiting Punishment of acquitted conduct um, act. And in a nutshell, the Safer uh, Detention Act would basically streamline uh, compassionate release, home detention processes. It would remove some of the bureaucratic obstacles that really absolutely serve no purpose and only serve to endanger lives. And while I will say conceived as reforms during a pandemic, these changes are really nevertheless critical beyond any health crisis. We have the First Step Implementation Act uh, which will further um, fulfill the purposes of the First Step Act uh, to rectify the unjust applications of uh, sentencing statutes and ensure appropriate paths to reentry, making um, certain provisions um, retroactive, the, the whole sh extreme sentences with respect to stacked um, um, gun cases. I, I didn't hear the earlier, but I know Weldon Angelos was the one, he's the poster child with respect uh, to that. And, you know, those who served 20 years um, for offense committed when they were juveniles, sealing and expungement, all of those things are part of the First Step uh, Implementation Act. 
And then we have this prohibiting punishment of acquitted conduct act. I mean, it, this is a very widely criticized feature of federal law. I mean, current law allows judges to override a jury's not guilty verdict by sentencing defendants for the very same conduct that they were acquitted of by jury, by, you know, by a jury in a trial. There's a problem with that. The, the standard is supposed to be beyond a reasonable doubt, but the standard that the judge uses is um, the much lesser standard of a preponderance of the evidence. So that is something that needs to change. And there are other bills. It's the Grace Act, which streamlines the compassionate release process. But I just want to speak to one more bill. And I would like to be optimistic to say that it has some chance of passage, but it is called the Second Look Act. The Second Look Act, which was introduced um, in the last term by um, Senator Booker, I know he's going to be introducing it. It basically allows someone who served at least 10 years in federal prison to just petition, to ask the court, to just take a second look. Look at who I am today, as opposed to who I was 10, 20, 30, 40 you know, years ago. Because there's no parole in the federal system, there's no opportunity for someone to come back before a judicial officer to tell how much that they have changed. So this legislation will create a rebuttable presumption um, for the release of petitioners who are 50 years of age or um, older. All the studies show that recidivism goes down so very far the older one gets. So I'm really hoping that that second look at um, sees the light of day. Yeah, as, as are we, and let us know, of course, how we can support that effort. Uh, you, you just listed a, a bunch of great bills, including Second Look. So, you know, what I want to pivot to is when, when, when you've got this kind of firepower together, what are we going up against and how do we overcome it? And, and Mr. District Attorney, I want to turn to you because, you know, you've, you've been elected in, in two cities, which is not common for district attorneys. And, and you, can, you were pretty clear in your campaign for L.A. that we are going to shake up the system. We're going to bring in some really bold reforms. And you put out a memo right out of the gate showing how serious you were. And obviously you got some pushback. And I'd love to share with you because, you know, what you're experiencing is what I think a lot of uh, reform legislators and district attorneys and, and mayors are experiencing across the country. When they try to reform the, the criminal legal system, they get they get punched back hard. And I'd love you to talk about sort of how you've been able to to deal with that and what your sort of solutions are for overcoming the very robust opposition to some of the things that we're talking about. No, and, and you're absolutely right. And you know, for those that may not know, I was elected district attorney in San Francisco County for two terms. So I was a DA there for over eight years. Uh, and then I got elected in LA County uh, six months ago. And you know, the, the dealing with fear mongering and you know, the pushback from the system is something that I became accustomed to. And now obviously in LA now is is probably 10 times stronger than it was in San Francisco. But basically, the, the way that I work through this is, first of all, you have to talk to people. you got to try to educate people. So I try as much as I can and as succinctly as we can talk about the science around incarceration, why there are limitations to whether incarceration is going to make us safer or not. Talk about recidivism. Talk about the fact that, you know, when you over-criminalize young people or, or, or low-level offenders, actually, you end up buying a, a life of crime that you would always, you could avoid otherwise. You know, there are increasingly more and more studies out there that shows that actually prosecutors can create crime by prosecuting cases. So it's really both an educational process, but you know, frankly, the other part is just holding the line and, and being willing to, you know, to take the punches sometimes, right? You, you gotta stand on your principles. Uh, as you indicated, you know, in, LA County, of course, I came with the benefit of having been an elected prosecutor for eight years. So I came with a very, and elected in LA with a very clear platform. Those are the things that we're going to do. And they won. The day I got inaugurated, actually, we put out a whole bunch of directives. Here's how we're going to do things. And then we started dealing with it. So it's educating people, but it's also holding the line when you have to. Absolutely. Well, Representative Armstrong, can you speak to this as well? I mean, we know there are folks out there like, uh, the Tom Cottons of the world who are, are trying to untangle some of the great work that, that people like yourself are doing in Congress. And how do you how do you push back on that fear mongering narrative that the district attorney talked about that we know it's got it's gotten louder in the last 12 months? 
Yeah, and I think a lot of it is, I mean, how everything works. And I think this is a real area. I would just like to say to Nikisha, first of all, uh, Representative Cohen and I are working on the House Companion to the Acquitted Conduct Act. It'd probably be in introduced already, but I want to expand it. And we also have an exculpatory evidence bill that I think uh, you all will like about uh, in federal court. But I think the real issue, and you can go across every rural town um, across the country, and until very recently, you know, the policy and the politics are very different. You don't find many prosecutors and many sheriffs who get elected being soft on crime, right? Uh, in particular in those spaces. But what we have seen in states like North Dakota over the last 10 years is it's expensive, recidivism is there, and we continue to do things. And I, I mean, we've gotten creative. I, one thing that the DA said earlier that I really like is, and it's my personal mission, we got to stop defelonizing. We have to start defelonizing young adults. Uh, you know, for the vast majority of your first offense, simple possession felonies, nobody spends a day in jail if they spend a day in prison. What they do become is a felon for the rest of their life at 19 years old. And expungements are great and all of those things are great. But I'm telling you, my PI, when I was a lawyer, would find that expunged criminal conviction in about 30 seconds. The Internet's a wonderful thing, but it follows you forever. So we have to keep pushing back. And then I would also say, I think one of the issues between Democrats and Republicans, even the Democrats who agree on or Republicans, who agree on a lot of these issues is the role of the federal government versus the state's governments. And that's where I think if the, if the three of us talked for a long time, we probably would have some differences. We want the same outcome. Sometimes we just believe they should happen in different ways. Great. Well, last question on this topic is, is to you, Nikichi. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, there are plenty of Democrats who I think agree with the things we're saying, but are getting a little weak in the need because of, again, the pushback the, the tabloid headlines they're seeing in their communities. You know, what's, how do you think we need to, to also make sure that, you know, the, the left side of the table is, is going to stand strong on criminal justice reform in, in the face of these sort of negative attacks that are, have been coming in the last few months? Well, it's not um, anything uh, new. I mean, <laughs> back in the 90s, back, back in the 80s, the Democrats were trying to out tough the Republicans on crime. I mean, I remember vividly candidate Clinton leaving the campaign trail to oversee the execution of a mentally challenged uh, person in uh, uh, Arkansas. And mm -hmm. it was all about the votes, you know. But I am pleased to say the Second Chance Reentry Bill, the Fair Sentencing Act, the First Step Act, none of these bills would have passed if it were not for the left and the right coming together. Mm -hmm. It has happened before. First Step Act was not the first time in 2018 that it happened. I would live through it. I worked with it, me, working with conservatives, yeah. making it happen. I mean, I'm just saying. So, um, yeah, this pushback. But I think what needs to happen is, forgive me, y'all, but folks need to be out there in the streets, okay, making sure that elected officials do what they have come to Congress uh, to do, and that is, you know, represent their um, interests. I think that we need to be bold. I need to think that we need to be talking about stopping, ending all mandatory uh, minimum uh, sentences. I think we need to be talking about a health-centered approach to substance abuse uh, issues. When I see that video in Ocean City mm. of that young teenager who's yeah. knocked to the ground and tased and hot tied because he's vaping. Now, you and I may not agree with vaping. I surely don't. I didn't agree with crack cocaine either. But right was right and wrong was wrong. And it wasn't right to have a sentence for crack cocaine that was 100 times more severe than the same sentence for powder cocaine. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying is there are other ways of dealing with conduct we don't like rather than criminalizing them and over punishing them that we've got to find a better way and we got to find it together. Whether we're Democrats, whether we're Republicans, whether we're the left, whether we're the right, whether we're conservative, whether we're red, we've got to find a way to come together and do it right. Absolutely. Well said. And to, to piggyback off your point about getting in the streets, getting more active, I mean, we're going to be revving up our work soon. Uh, uh, DA, Mr. Gascon, you know, you've been elected uh, uh, district attorney in, in two places. How do you think, to, speaking to our viewers out there who may be not as politically engaged, that they're they're trying to figure out how they can end the drug war. You know, what is the most effective way for people to get involved in a way that supports people like yourself, people who are similarly trying to work at the DA or mayoral level? 
around the country. You know, how, how have you seen people getting involved, making a difference? Like what are specific calls to action you would suggest from your vantage point? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. First of all, you, you have to be informed. You have to really take a little bit of time to be an informed voter. You have to educate yourself. Uh, you have to vote, obviously. If you don't vote, you know, you, you don't count. Uh, but I think the, the biggest advantage in what people can bring to the table uh, that can make a tremendous difference is really talking to your community, questioning people, looking at your elected officials to make sure that they are doing the things that you want them to do uh, and holding them accountable when they don't. You know, I, I think that, you know, there are certainly two electeds here in this uh, you know, this room, we know that when we get a bunch of emails from, from the people in our community, we pay attention, right? You know, the democracy does work, but you got to start from a place of knowledge. You need to educate yourself. You need to understand that so long as we continue to criminalize behavior that, that is really driven by health and economics, we continue to waste a tremendous amount of money without necessarily becoming a safer community. To the contrary, we create more insecurity. So I would say educate yourself, be active, vote, hold people accountable. Well said, thank you. Rep Armstrong, uh, same question to you. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to learn that emails work because sometimes you're not sure when you're emailing a representative if that's getting open. But yeah, what, what makes a difference for, I mean, you, you, you're getting lobbied on a whole bunch of things. How, how do people change office, you know, the perspective of your colleagues, you think? Yeah, well, I think recognizing that, I mean, we all come from different backgrounds, but I'm really proud of the work we did in North Dakota. And the federal government's always going to move slower. We all know that, but it's happening. And there is criminal justice reform in Democrat states, Republican states, conservative states, liberal states, uh, and they're moving across there. And I think just continuing to recognize it. And I will say this, at least from my experience, and I've, I've been doing this a long time, uh, maybe not as long as uh, others, but just the change in how law enforcement, particularly with addiction related crimes, has has really changed in, in, in a way and in, in, in places you wouldn't necessarily believe it. So continuing to engage them, making sure they're part of the process and then mm -hmm. recognize things that we we should do better uh, enhancements in school zones. Uh, different things that really, really have disparate impacts and don't actually serve the don't actually serve what they were intended to serve so much as create more incarceration, more issues like that. But then the offer, answer is we got to get better services, addiction services everywhere in the country. Um, I can guarantee you neither one of any none of it. Nobody on this call thinks they have enough in their own community. And if you don't have them in your community, we don't have them in Watford City, North Dakota. So that's the other thing we have to do is get more and more of those services out there. Well, that's a perfect segue to the very last question. Uh, and uh, we'll just do like a minute each on this one and we'll work backwards. So, so Representative Armstrong, I'll start with you. You've all laid out a bunch of great reforms that are happening right now that we hope to pass this year, maybe the next two years. But you know, if we were to dream, dream big, you know, 10 years from now, what is one aspect of the war on drugs that you hope just uh, is completely transformed 10, five to 10 years from now? I hope it's less than that. Federal civil asset forfeiture reform. Uh, that's the, the number one. Uh, states have done a good job on it, but federal civil asset forfeiture reform. Congressman Wahlberg, Congressman Raskin have reintroduced what I think is a really good bill. My one B to that would be getting rid of equitable sharing because I think that would solve about 60, 65% of the civil asset forfeiture problem right mm -hmm. now. But that would be my big thing, civil asset forfeiture re reform. I think it's it, it's draconian. It's I don't think it's constitutional. And I think it has really, really disparate impacts on people. Wonderful. Nikichi? Oh, I would agree with him with civil asset forfeiture. I would say the um, uh, second look at, I would say the ending of mandatory minimum sentences. And I know earlier we were talking about cannabis and equity. I'm just going to show you my T-shirt. Reparations. Okay, I'm just saying <laughs> equity, you know, rep, rep, you said 10 years or whatever. Dream big. I put yeah. it out there. I love it. Mr. DA, uh, take us home. You know, I'm going to say in the drug arena, because I could go into a lot of different directions, I would say let's follow the Portuguese model, let's medicalize drug use and move away from the criminal justice system into a public health system, and we would be much better off. Perfect. Well, I, I'm so thrilled. We're all so lucky that we got to spend uh, this last half hour with this group and with all the previous panelists, but you especially, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to, as DreamCorps, to work with each of you in, in the year ahead. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dallas. Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Thank you. All right. Well, this has been an action-packed two hours. We've heard from incredible people, uh, and hopefully you've all learned a lot. Uh, I think two things I want to leave people with. One is the recurring message that everybody has a part to play, whether you're an elected official, an advocate, an athlete, an artist, uh, and no matter who you are, there is stuff to do to jump in to help. And so uh, please go to thedreamcore.org to get involved. Um, we're going to be dropping links uh, if you're watching on Facebook to for how people can get involved, how people can petition around the Equal Act, Federal Clemency, the Empathy Network. Uh, there's just a lot we can do right now this year to get done. And the last thing I'm going to say is if we succeed in passing these bills, if we succeed in organizing, we can do something really special this next couple of years, which is close a lot of federal prisons. And the next time you're going to see an event from us at Dream Corps, it's going to be announcing the launch of our federal prison closure campaign. And so I hope people stay, stay tuned for that and get excited about what we can do in a country with a lot fewer prisons and the resources we can save to put into things like the services that our last panel was talking about. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to The Last Prisoner Project for hosting us. Thank you for Weldon Angelos for being such a good partner and Mission Green for all the work that they're doing in the community. Thank you once again for everybody who participated, who joined us. Uh, we hope to be in touch with all of you soon and change the world together. Have a good night. <laughs>